All right, welcome back, U.S. History students. We are here for our first video within Unit 3. Back to all the excitement that is our pre-class videos. Uh, this one's going to be looking a little bit different, specifically because of the viewing guide that you have that I uh, gave to you and explained during class. So I want to make sure you guys are paying attention to that viewing guide as you're watching this, either on paper or uh, on your computer screen and that you're following along with that uh, guide because of the fact that this video is a little bit longer than normal. So we're starting a brand new unit. You guys just took your unit two test, and we are getting into unit three now, which is moving squarely into the 1920s. We've spent the whole part, first part of this course talking about the 1870s, basically up until 1920. And we are moving now into the 1920s for this entire unit. And we barely get out of it as we end the term and move into unit four. And really today's uh, topic and what we're going to be discussing for the next couple days is the, this idea of conservatism during the 1920s and how this concept and this definition of conservatism dominates uh, this decade of American history. It's really a huge reaction to everything that we've just covered. So I want you to take a second in your viewing guide and you have a question that asks, what does it mean to be conservative? And in that box, I want you to write or type as many things as you can that, um, that you think of when you hear the word conservative or what does it mean to be conservative? Uh, I would suggest right now that you pause this video Give yourself a couple minutes or maybe just a minute or two and just try and get in as many things in that box as you that pop into your head when you think of the word conservative because this is going to be dominant for uh, this entire unit. So I would pause the video now, take a couple seconds and type in as many things as you can in there. All right, so we're going to look at that box in class uh, tomorrow. You may get a little bit better of idea as we go along with this video about what being conservative means, but we're going to really sum it up and get you a concrete definition of it in class tomorrow. We have something here that's called the political spectrum, and this is where everybody that um, lives within a country that has a government, so that is everybody in the world, um, their views about politics allow you to fall somewhere on this political spectrum. You guys have probably heard the word left wing and right wing or those terms being applied to individuals before, but you're never knowing fully what they mean. It refers to the political spectrum and being basically liberal on the left or conservative on the right. The closer you are to the middle, the more moderate you are. The farther left or the farther right you are, the more extreme your political views. If we're going to go far, far left on the political spectrum, we're going to hit communism, where the government is dominating and controlling every economic aspect of an individual's life. Basically, that the state or the government is owning and operating all forms of business. On the far extreme end of the right conservative side, we have fascism, where the government is controlling every last aspect of your social life, telling you what you can and can't do in terms of your own decision making. So those are the two far ends of the spectrum that are typically seen as negative. But being somewhere on this political spectrum is totally um, expected and everybody falls somewhere on the spectrum. You may be more left or more right uh, based on your own political views. But during the 1920s uh, in the United States, conservatism and being on the right end of this political spectrum, believing that people's one, social lives should be less controlled by the government, and two, that businesses excuse me, that your social lives should be totally or more so controlled by the government and that your economic lives should not be controlled by the government uh, lands you somewhere on the right end of the spectrum. And that's what we're looking at here in the 1920s, a return to conservatism in this country. Now I want you to take a couple seconds and write in that other box in your viewing guide, what are things that Americans fear? No, spiders, snakes, and other scary bugs are not the answer in this case. 
horror movies and Halloween are also not the answer in this case. But what are things that generally Americans fear in terms of um, enemies or what do we see as kind of bad in America and something that we should be fearful of? I would pause it again and get as many things as you can written into that box. All right, we'll talk about that tomorrow as well. But here we're going to really get into the rest of your viewing guide and really getting in some concrete definitions of all those terms you have in there. So remember, during this time period that we're talking about, we have a huge wave of immigration. All our last two units have been talking about this huge wave of immigration. But we, as we see by the 1920s, it's starting to drop off. And immediately after and during the 1920s, it takes a huge, sharp decrease. You see just a humongous drop-off in the amount of people coming to our country. And that has a lot to do with 1920s conservatism. And I also want you guys to remember this term, nativism. Nativism makes its absolute return during the 1920s. Nativist ideals that waspy values. Remember, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. You're a Protestant Christian, you're white, and you're coming from northern um, or Western Europe, kind of those original American values. That's nativism, believing that America is waspy. It makes a huge return and combat during the 1920s. We have political cartoons like this. We have undesirable. This immigrant being portrayed as a ticking time bomb, walking in through a door labeled immigration restrictions because it's wide open. There are no restrictions. We have Uncle Sam here bending over a large um, vat here that has a bunch of anti-American ideals or actually things that American feels in here. Bolshevism, red flag, the mad notions of Europe, un-American ideals, anarchy, uh, kind of. And we have the headline here, we can't digest this scum. Uncle Sam seeing all of these things that immigrants are bringing into America and this nativist kind of rip returns to America and puts its stranglehold on our people. We have nativism. We also have isolationism being a huge term that's dominating the 1920s. The United States rejects the League of Nations. We do not want to be a part of it. And it's a signal that the United States government is going to kind of rein in this era of imperialism, stop spreading our values around the world, and kind of focus on ourselves. We are no longer going to tie our interests and our roles within this world to other countries. We're still going to keep control of the places that we have, but we're not going to continue to expand. World War I kind of left a bad taste in our mouth. We didn't want to involve ourselves with the doings of the rest of the world any longer. And after World War I, we have all these soldiers returning home. And since we don't have to produce things for the war anymore, business starts to slow down a bit. The War Industries Board is dissolved, and all industry is not pointed and directed towards uh, producing things for the war anymore. But soldiers are coming back, and they need jobs, but they find that their jobs have been taken up by women and minority groups, these immigrant groups who maybe weren't fighting in the war, and they're having difficulty getting uh, jobs. These war veterans are a little bit disgruntled. They don't have um, access to the same things that they had before. So everything that's happening during the progressive era kind of comes to a head here. Um, immigrants have started taking jobs. Soldiers are returning home, and there's this kind of clash. And when things don't go the way that we want them to, and when things aren't going the right way, we always tend to blame the others. And in this case, the others are those immigrant groups, once again, that were here that uh, had immigrated to the United States, and by the 1920s, they were starting to settle, and that really bothered many of those waspy nativist Americans. So we have, again, this political cartoon where Uncle Sam is being swallowed by both ends. Do we still see this today? Well, absolutely, and I uh, these pictures are coming before Donald Trump was an actual uh, legitimate political candidate, but many people think that some of his viewpoints are very nativist, that He's focusing on, especially with his idea to build the wall, that that is against immigrants. And in part it is, and in part it's not. It's kind of your opinion. 
you have this political cartoon here of a man kind of speaking up his views. Make America white again. Our current president is a Muslim and not from this country. We have Muslim training camps. Trump saying, you, sir, I will not tolerate. Get those Oreos out of my rally, focusing on something totally not um, to the point of what the man is actually saying. Nativism is kind of a part of our culture at all times. But during the 1920s, it's beginning to absolutely dominate. We can sum it up with the slogan of Keep America American. And American is waspy. So we have another event during the 1920s that begins to dominate, something called the Red Scare. In a second, Russia undergoes a revolution during World War I where their government is overthrown. And I know you guys cover this during World probably a bit. And it's taken over by a group of people called the Bolsheviks who are communists and install a communist government in Russia. Again, communism, where the government controls all business. The state owns everything, provides people with jobs, determines your salary. Everything is controlled by the government in terms of the economy. And people are kind of fearful of that here in America because communism is not an American ideal. Democracy is an American ideal. And communism is in direct conflict with, with democracy and capitalism, a free market system. The Communist Party uh, kind of starts here in the United States and 70,000 people join it, some of them part of the Industrial Workers of the World, which is a really powerful labor union group here in the United States. And individuals that were part of the Communist Party begin acts of domestic terrorism here in the United States. They were mailing bombs to government officials and business leaders, which gets people really freaked out that the communist revolution and this uh, red scare is going to come to the United States. It's going to overthrow our government and change our way of life. We have this cartoon here. Um, foreign extremist. This is a communism being knocked out by an American labor union, the patriotic American. We have this picture here, America being depicted as a tree with some bulges, fungus, growing on the tree. It says fungus down here, labeled red aliens or red immigrants. Red is that color that we associate with communism, and we see their faces growing on the trees as a fungus, kind of eroding at the base of America here. We have another depiction of communism and Bolshevism here where the kind of key to success, the latter success is industry, thrift, meaning kind of being frugal and watching your money carefully, knowledge, skill, supported by law and order being the latter to success. Communism over here being represented by a rocket that you're just trying to get to the top without having to do any work. Too slow for me. We're scared of communism. That color red is associated with it. I need to pound that into your head because we'll use that term a lot. But communism is scary, and people in the 1920s thought it was coming to the United States. So much so that between November 1919 and January 1920, hundreds of people around the United States that were suspected of being communists, socialists, or anarchists were arrested or deported by a guy who happens to be our attorney general at the time, A. Mitchell Palmer. Uh, he put a man named J. Edgar Hoover in charge of carrying out these acts. So we're bursting into people's homes. We suspect them to be communists or socialists or anarchists, all these things that conflict with democracy and capitalism. We think that they're going to be taking over our country, but we don't actually end up turning up any evidence or any plots of revolutions or communist agendas um, turning up after the Palmer Raid. So it's kind of a big overreaction to the Red Scare during this time where we're actually trampling on the rights of American citizens, but coming up short. We have another high profile uh, media event, the trial of Sacco and Vanzetti that we'll see in a video for a minute here. But we have two Italian immigrants. Again, they're undesirable. Italians are not waspy. They're Catholic. They're bad. They're going to bring communism or something bad to the United States. Um, they're charged with armed robbery and murder based on some really kind of poor evidence. There's not a whole lot of evidence to link them to a crime, but because they're anarchists, 
meaning they just don't believe in any government at all. People got really fired up about this, and they really wanted to see their heads roll. They're found guilty and sentenced to death, despite the fact that, again, there wasn't great evidence to get them and against them, and both of them are executed August of 1927, so seven years after the original crime was committed. Um, well into the 1920s is a decade. We have these two men executed despite the fact that we're looking back on the evidence now, and the evidence isn't very good. So we're going to watch this quick review video. You can add to your viewing guide as you watch it. In the early 1920s, many Americans were terrified that communists would attempt to take over the country. Who were the communists? Why was there such a widespread fear of them? In 1917, Russia was taken over by a communist group known as the Bolsheviks. Communism is an economic system in which there is no private ownership of businesses or property. Because the average American takes great pride in the personal ownership of homes and businesses, communism was viewed as a threat to the American way of life. From the moment this revolution occurred in Russia, there were widespread fears that a similar type of communist uprising would occur in the United States. Some Americans felt that the recent influx of immigrants from Eastern Europe, where communist and anarchist philosophies were prevalent, only increased the likelihood of such an event. In 1919, it appeared that many of these fears would be proven correct. A plot was uncovered in which 36 bombs were mailed out to important political figures, as well as prominent businessmen. U.S. Attorney General Alexander Palmer and Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. were both targeted. John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan were also threatened. On June 2, 1919, eight more bombs exploded simultaneously in different cities across the country. Following these two incidents, the U.S. Justice Department launched a series of raids that came to be known as the Palmer Raids. This was an attempt to arrest and deport communists and anarchists who were seen as potentially dangerous. More than 500 foreign-born citizens were eventually deported. This panic over a communist threat became known as a Red Scare. The term is derived from a popular nickname, Reds, which was used to identify communists. Several other perceived threats also emerged in the 1920s. In April of 1920, two men were murdered during an armed robbery at a shoe factory in Braintree, Massachusetts. Two anarchists were blamed for the crime. Nicholas Sacho, and Bartolomeo Vanzetti both believed in a form of anarchism that promoted violent warfare against oppressive governments. They were placed on trial for the crime of murder and were eventually found guilty and sentenced to death. There was much controversy and doubt as to whether these two men actually committed the crime, but the frightened public was searching for a scapegoat to blame. Their sentences of execution were carried out in August of 1927. On the heels of this incident, a rumor began circulating that a major uprising would occur on May 1, 1920, but this never materialized. However, on September 1, 1920, a bomb exploded on Wall Street. 38 people lost their lives and more than 140 were injured. Communists and anarchists were immediately seen as potential suspects. Many were brought in and questioned, but ultimately, no arrests were made. There was almost certainly a strong communist and anarchist presence in the United States in the late 19-teens and 1920s. However, it is largely believed that most of the fear over communist uprisings was the result of mass hysteria and paranoia. All right, so that kind of briefly overviews the Red Scare during the 1920s, and we'll talk about that more in class. If you feel like you need to take a break for a second, maybe pause, uh, do something else for a couple minutes, but make sure you come back to finish the rest of this video because it all is uh, very important for class tomorrow. So we just have a little bit left here. 
and it's focusing in on something that you've probably heard of before, but really never talked about in depth, and that's the rise of an organization and a group called the KKK or the Ku Klux Klan. So the Red Scare and nativism caused uh, a lot of groups to start to spring up, bigoted groups. When we say we're a bigot, you mean you're intolerant of other ideas or cultures. And the KKK really has a big problem with the immigrant groups coming in here because they're not American. They're bringing in their foreign devil governments and ideas and their religions. And we need to keep America American. That's kind of the slogan of the Ku Klux Klan uh, during this time. By 1924, there are four and a half million members of the KKK, which is a humongous, humongous number. All of them being white native-born Protestant men, men who had grown up here in the United States that were not immigrants, that identified with WASP values. They opposed everything from African Americans to just foreign people and immigrants in general. They definitely wanted the Jews out of the United States and especially despised the Catholics as well. They got very violent. They are a violent group. Uh, they committed both acts of violence and murder across this country. And we'll talk more about the KKK in class, but just know that this is a very nativist group that sees humongous numbers and four and a half million members by 1924. Now, their violent acts kind of caused the group to shrivel up again, but as we will see later in this course, more in December and January, they do make a return. And this last real um, term that we need to cover is something that was called the quota system. So this reaction to all these immigrants coming into the United States really comes to a head in 1921 with something called the Emergency Quota Act. Uh, people realized that we were just having or thought that we had too many immigrants coming into this country and that we needed to start to limit it if we go back to that graph we saw at the beginning of the video, we see the huge drop off in the number of immigrants in the 1920s. That's because of the Emergency Quota Act. We start placing limits on the amount of immigrants that can come from different parts of the world. We see Uncle Sam here. We have the funnel of all these people coming in through Europe, but he's kind of putting in different um, percentages. 3% gate, meaning you're only letting in a certain amount of people. And that's what we start doing. We start only letting in a certain amount or a quota of people from each country in Europe and other countries as well. In fact, we completely ban all immigration coming from Japan uh, with the Emergency Quota Act, but we're severely limiting the amount of people that are coming into the nation. This is a huge reaction to these nativist views that our country is changing too much. We have too many new people come in. We need to slow down and reassess this situation. So that's the Emergency Quota Act. <laughs> So one last review video here, just kind of looking at nativism in the 1920s, and then I promise we are done. In the 1920s, a new wave of nativism swept across the United States. What is nativism? What were the results of this movement? The United States has long had a history of being distrustful of immigrants. Even in the earliest days of the nation, Laws such as the Alien and Sedition Act were passed, which limited the rights of immigrants. In the 1850s, many... Not the same as the Espionage and Sedition Acts that we just talked about. ...he started using the term nativist to describe those who opposed Irish Catholic immigrants. The term was used to describe those who descended from the original 13 colonies. Rather than referring to Native Americans as the term native would be used today. During the years of World War I, there was a strong...